My name is Sarah Overton. I'm the production manager for the Dream Unfinished Orchestra, and I'm joined today by Un Lee, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Dream Unfinished. Uh, so today, I think we're going to start our Instruments for Change segment just by talking a little bit about Puerto Rican statehood. And uh, we named this episode 531 to 51 um, just because we were thinking about Puerto Rico um, and when the first uh, colony was started on Puerto Rico, which was uh, nearly a little bit more than 513 years ago. Um, and then now today we're talking about the possibility of Puerto Rico being the 51st state of the United States. So, and can you chat a little bit more um, about just kind of what we've been learning as two classical musicians trying to navigate, um, you know, these these democratic processes and these these new waters, these uh, new territories here. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, and I will be uh, frank in that, uh, as as we all know, um, Puerto Rico obviously. Um, has a very close relationship with the U.S. Um, and Puerto Rican uh, people from people who are Puerto Rican are U.S. citizens. Um, but there is this very sort of ambiguous status that's conferred upon them. And so, frankly, um, before Sarah and I had done more sort of homework and legwork on this, I think I had operated under the assumption that generally uh, Puerto Ricans wanted to be admitted as a state to the US so that they could have, you know, full, like all this sort of full status um, as, as do, you know, other parts of the country. Um, but this article that we found from Slate actually does a really good job of covering how this is a much more complex issue than certainly I had been aware of. Um, and, you know, one, it, 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 it kind of frames it as far as, First of all, like why this matters to uh, current American politics and like where, you know, Democrats tend to fall versus, um, you know, Republicans as and and even within the Democratic Party specifically, like why this is a divisive issue. Um, but then it also brings up this really good point of, you know, how actually within Puerto Rico, um, it's not really, it, it's, it's um, there are many different factions and many different sort of schools of thought around like how this could play out. Um, so let's see, like where in the, yeah, so this is a lot around like the Democrat versus Republican sort of divide on this. Um, but that and the reason why this is all coming up recently is because um, there is now this uh, Puerto Rico Self Determination Act, um, and a, a previous version of which was meant to be introduced last year, it has just been reintroduced in the last, I would say, couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, the reason that's why all of this is in the news now. Um, but there is this uh, feeling amongst Puerto Ricans, I can't find it because this article is so bad. Um, but in this article, it actually goes into great detail around, you know, how uh, within the Puerto Rican and Puerto Rican American community, that there is um, just a lot of difference of opinion. Um, and so I, again, wasn't aware of these sorts of things, but um, just to get it, put a finer point on this. So, um, as you we were saying earlier, um, it seems that there is this prevailing view of just this question of whether or not Puerto Rico should be a state in the country, and that this discourse is largely being uh, pushed back and forth between Democrats and Republicans. And then there is, of course, a, a vocal group of Puerto Rican and Puerto Rican American, um, you know, activists and politicians who are weighing on on this. This is interesting though, because it is basically like under the assumption of Puerto Rico wants to be a part of the US directly, right? Um, and I think part of the angle of, of a bill like this one is, you know, 
the U.S. wants to stop being colonizers and wants to stop treating Puerto Rico like a colony. But why that's ironic is because it's still being determined by the U.S. Whereas I think the the distinction with uh, this new bill that was introduced last year and is being reintroduced now is um, so it's the Puerto Rican Self Determination Act. So even just kind of looking at the the a uh, very quick summary of both. So this is to enable the admission of Puerto Rico as a state of the union, period. Whereas here, it's actually very different language, even though it's on the same sort of issue, um, a status convention through which the people of Puerto Rico would exercise their natural right to self-determination and so then it's really not uh, the U.S. deciding whether or not Puerto Rico gets to be a state, but it's that Puerto Ricans get to decide what relationship they want to have with the U.S. Right, right. And I think that um, especially just with the change of this language being a little bit more specific to recognize the right of the people of Puerto Rico and then to exercise their natural right to self-determination, I think is a really interesting twist of language. Um, and it's also important to note, too, that uh, if the people of Puerto Rico come together and come to a consensus about how they want to be associated with the U.S., it doesn't necessarily mean statehood. There are a lot of different options for um, the people of Puerto Rico. It could be something like a uh, free association, um, which is status like, uh, you know, former U.S. colonies like the Palau and Marshall Islands. You could have enhanced commonwealths. Uh, or in, be an enhanced commonwealth, um, you know, it could be statehood, it could be full independence. Uh, there's a lot of directions for this to go. And it's just the um, opportunity and the option uh, for the people of Puerto Rico to choose and vote on those options. And I see you, you've got a lot of these different options up here too. Yeah, so um, exactly what uh, you had just summarized, Sarah, um, this, and we can include this in the links in the, um, in the description of the clip uh, once it's posted afterwards. But, um, you know, this uh, does a good job of covering four of the options, uh, you know, what it is currently, um, this enhanced commonwealth, um, which is sort of a, it, I guess, a, a more beefed up version <laughs> of what it is currently. Um, then, of course, statehood. And then, you know, if it wanted to just be a completely separate country. Um, and then there is, and what's not listed in this particular summary, but we can also add here is, um, is this idea of free association. Um, and, you know, this article is very sort of bent, or it has an angle it's talking about how like free association is the only thing or the best thing. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, but it does do a good job of explaining what exactly free association is, because it is kind of this sort of it, it does kind of come across as murky and in between its current Commonwealth status uh, where it has these sorts of limitations versus like full independence. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 and this is old data, but I think still, you know, salient for the conversation. So this was a plebiscite that was held in 1998. And it's interesting to see just kind of how it shook out at that time. Um, so, you know, and that actually, while there was roughly 50% that had voted for statehood, there was another more than, slightly more than 50% that voted on none of the above. <laughs> um, so clearly this is a, a topic that is still, there is no um, unanimous sort of voice from Puerto Rico specifically, as far as like a, what needs to be the best option. And, and that's why I think the Self-Determination Act is so interesting because it's, it's, it's at least putting the ball in their court versus you know something like this, where again, it would be the US deciding whether or not it's admitted. And I think that this is really just kind of demanding a, a reframing of, of what the relationship is between Puerto Rico and the US. Yeah, absolutely. And and there are pros and cons to each. Um, you know, I, I think we're 
as we're moving forward and learning more and more about, um, you know, the next steps for the people of Puerto Rico, um, they're, they're explore, exploring just kind of how these pros and cons um, tie into one another. I know, especially for statehood status, um, you know, the, the Puerto Rico's population is about 3.2 million people, um, which is more than 20 U.S. states, um, not combined, mm -hmm. but more than, um, you know, the population of about 20 different U.S. states. Um, and if it were to become a state, it would be eligible for two Senate seats and five House seats um, as a part of the United States. So just really interesting in terms of how uh, the people of Puerto Rico want to move forward as a legislative body, either for themselves or as a part of the U.S., definitely. Yeah. And I mean, as you're pointing out, Sarah, so in the same Slate article that I was able to navigate a little better, despite all these weird ads. Um, uh, so for more recent data, there was a statehood referendum. Um, mm -hmm. And it, this was different as well, because it only gave two options, either yes or no to statehood. And so statehood did win. But as we can see, it's by a very narrow margin of 52.5 to 47.5 percent. And, you know, it does beg the question of if it was like what happened in 1998 and if there were these other options that were on the table, then, you know, where that would leave us and, and um, what it is that um, is is intended and, and, and what people are, are asking for. So, um, you know, definitely wanting to um, just uh, highlight that this is a, a topic and, and similarly for what we've done in previous episodes, sharing around organizations that, um, you know, may not be necessarily directly related to um, the Puerto Rico, uh, you know, status question, but are serving Puerto Ricans uh, in a really important and meaningful work. Um, the first is uh, Tayer Sayud, Salud, I hope, I have terrible Spanish pronunciation. Uh, I hope that was some approximation of something that's correct. Um, but doing a lot of really great work uh, with uh, Puerto Rican women specifically. Um, and then also this group, um, the Artist Safety Net through, um, I, I guess it's uh, the CERF. And they have been doing, um, you know, initiatives specific to artists. Um, so, you know, the stat here, They've been working with more than 300 artists in Puerto Rico, um, largely in response to COVID specifically. Uh, but as people are also aware, you know, unfortunately, Puerto Rico has been dealing with a, a real sort of cascade of, nat of natural disasters in the last couple of years. So I think that um, a lot of this was also, you know, with that in context that um, artists all over, but I would say in are in in communities like Puerto Rico are especially hard hit. So uh, we'll make sure that these links are also included in the uh, description if folks are interested in um, supporting more work that's being done on the island. Yeah, absolutely. And these are these are really really wonderful resources. Thank you for sharing those. We'll definitely be sure to drop all of those links uh, within this kind of video, this YouTube video, uh, and definitely those resources that we mentioned earlier from Tyler, uh, Taya Salud, um, and just kind of, uh, you know, making sure that we have all of these things available for you. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us uh, today. Please come back next week. We're going to continue this exploration of activism and classical music and how the two intersect. Um, please hit the like and subscribe button. We're so happy that you're here and we hope that you'll come back um, and drop us a comment if you have any questions or suggestions or just want to, uh, you know, be a part of the TDU universe. Um, we are always happy to hear from you. So thank you again um, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.